please, and we'll just take our Bibles tonight. Let's turn to the book of Genesis, please. Genesis chapter 19. Genesis chapter 19. I've sure needed him to intercede for me more than once. And uh, he interceded for me the day that I got saved. And every day since, he's been interceding for me. Amen. Hebrews says that he ever liveth to make intercession for us. Amen. It means that's, that's what he's there to do. Right. People question, what is, where, what's Jesus doing? He's interceding. That, 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 that concept of an intercessor, we talked about that and preached on that this past Wednesday night about what an intercessor does. They, they go on the behalf of somebody else. We talked about intercessory prayer and how important it is that we pray for other people. We be interceders for them. Amen. But the only reason that you and I can intercede for anybody is because there's one interceding for us, the Lord Jesus Christ. There's not one prayer that could ever make it to the Father apart from Jesus interceding for us. Yeah. That's why we pray in Jesus' name. Because it is through Jesus Christ that we are praying. We're praying to the Father, but we can do that because of the ministry of Christ. Because He ever liveth to make intercession for us. I'm sure glad that He does. Amen? Genesis chapter number 19. And we preached, that probably sounds familiar, we preached out of this chapter uh, recently. Uh, we did so on Father's Day. We preached on the home. Not sure how many of you remember that. We preached out of verse number 8, Genesis 19, verse number 8, where Lot offers his daughters to the Sodomites of his day. We preached on sacrificing to Sodom. We preached on the home, charged the husbands, the fathers of the church, and talked about the importance of... Of, uh, of being the father, amen, to a home, of caring for your children, of caring for the, your family, for, for caring about the spiritual and the physical purity uh, of our children. We talked about that, and about how that our Sodom, which is outside of these doors, this world that we live in is a wicked world that wants to pervert, wants to corrupt our minds, our homes, our churches. We talked about that in this chapter. But there's a number of things that I didn't get to say because I was honing in on verse number 8, things that I would have liked to have said, and uh, we're going to try to say a few of those things in this message tonight. Every time that we read Genesis 19, I think we would do well to remember the words of Christ. Jesus said in Luke 17, verse number 27, speaking of the end days and what it will be like when Jesus comes again. In Luke 17, verse number 27, he says, speaking of the days of Noah, he said they did eat, they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark, and the flood came and destroyed them all. Speaking about how sudden the destruction that would fall from heaven fell during the days of Noah. And then it says, likewise also, as it was in the days of Lot. They did eat, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they builded. I think essentially what it's saying there is that they went about life as normal. They, they woke up the day in Sodom and Gomorrah that fire fell just like they had the day before. They were going through the, the mechanics and the routines of daily life in their area. And it was in a day when they didn't think it would come. That destruction fell from heaven, fire and brimstone that destroys the, the country of, in the area of Sodom and Gomorrah. Jesus said in, there in verse number 29, it says, But the same day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. So Jesus is taking the, the, what will be the last days, which I believe those are the days that we're living in. I believe that today could be the day that Jesus comes back, don't you? 
that Jesus could come back today and could rapture his church home to heaven and uh, it begin that tribulation period and begin to uh, the, that seventieth that week of Daniel and uh, Daniel's uh, or Jacob's trouble, that week of Jacob's trouble, and he could set up his earthly kingdom. And all of that stuff that could happen. I believe that could all start today. Jesus could come back today. And so what Jesus is doing is he's saying that in the day that I come back, in those last days, it's going to be just like it is, like it was in Lot's day. And so I can't help but when I read Genesis 19, I think about myself. Jesus said the last days are going to be like Lot's days. We're in the last days. And so I feel as if I can relate to Lot in that way. The world that Lot lived in is much similar to the world that you and I lived in, live in today. A world of depravity, a world of sin and wickedness that abounds on every hand. And you and I have to conduct ourselves and to live the Christian life in the midst of a wicked and a perverse generation. That's, that's what we've been tasked to do. And so when I read this passage and I read Genesis 19, I think about this character Lot... I don't think I've ever heard a positive message on Lot. Have you? You ever heard anybody praise Lot? Talk about all the wonders of Lot's life and how that Lot was faithful and all the good things that Lot did. That's not, that's not what we think about when we think about Lot. The, the, the name Lot evokes negativity. When we think Lot, we think of a failure. When we think of Lot, we think of wasted potential. When we think of Lot, we think of someone who was inconsistent. I'm going to show that to you here in the Word of God. We're introduced to Lot in Genesis chapter 12 and in verse number 1. If you want to turn there, you can. Let's look at Genesis 12. wasn't going to make you turn there. Now, as we noted in the last time we preached out of Genesis 19, the Bible tells us very plainly that Lot was a saved man. The Bible says in 2 Peter chapter 2, about the fact that, that he delivered just Lot, vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked, for that righteous man dwelling among them and seeing and hearing vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. And so the Word of God lets us know that Lot is a saved man. He has a righteous soul. And yet, when we read his life's account, we don't see a lot of that. We're introduced to him, Genesis 12 and verse number 1. The Bible says, Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee. And I will make, thee, uh, make of thee a great nation, and will bless thee, and I will make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that cursed thee. And in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. We know this passage of Scripture. This is the Abrahamic covenant. This is God's promise to Abraham of blessing if... You'll leave the Ur of the Chaldees. The the responsibility of Abraham was to obey and to to leave the the land of his kindred and to leave his father's house and to go to this land that God's going to tell him about. And in verse number 4, the Bible says, So Abram departed. I see great faith there, don't you? To to, to forsake the land that you live in and to follow God's word, not knowing where God's going to lead you. I see great faith here in Genesis chapter 12. So much faith that it landed Abraham in the hall of faith. The hall of fame, Hebrews chapter 11, the Bible says that Abraham did what he did in this verse by faith. Romans 4 said that this is when he believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. We're reading of of Abraham's salvation. God says, Abram, I want you to go. Abram goes, he believes God's word and that faith is counted for righteousness. But Abram is not, listen, Abram is not the only one who shows faith in these verses. Look at verse number 5. It says, And Abram took Sarai, his wife, and Lot, his brother's son, and all their substance that they had gathered, and the souls that they had gotten in Haran, and they went forth to go into the land of Canaan, and into the land of Canaan they came. That's when we are introduced to Lot. We're introduced to Lot doing the same thing that Abraham was doing. I'm going to say Abraham. Y'all know it's Abram. Y'all move on from that. It's all right. But, but, but Lot is doing the same thing that Abram is doing. Lot is exemplifying faith. He doesn't know where he's going either. 
But what he's going to do is he's going to follow Abram. He's going to follow God. He's following and he is believing the promise of God in Genesis chapter 12. I see a lot of positivity with Lot here in these verses. I believe that this is the moment that Lot believes the same promise that Abraham believed. And I believe that it's in this moment that he has this righteous soul. The New Testament tells us that he's saved. And we know that this is the account when Abram gets saved. So I believe this is the same time that Lot gets saved. Lot, Lot following, believing the promise, he obeys Abram and he follows him, not knowing where he is going. So that's when we're introduced to Lot. Let's look in chapter 13. Chapter 13, verse number 10. In this passage of Scripture, we find Lot disputing with Abram. There's a conflict between Lot's herdmen and, and Abram's herdmen. They're having conflict over territory and over waters. and they're, 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 The Bible says that there's too much substance for them to dwell together. He's having conflict with Abram. Verse number 10 says, And Lot lifted up his eyes and beheld all the plain of Jordan, that it was well watered everywhere. Before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, even as the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt, as thou comest unto Zoar, then Lot chose him all the plain of Jordan, and Lot journeyed east, and they separated themselves the one from the other. So in chapter 12, we find an example of Lot's faith. He's doing good. Now in Genesis 13, we find him fighting and arguing with Abram over territory. Now he's not doing good. In Genesis chapter 14, we're not going to take time to read it, but many of you know what takes place. In Genesis chapter 14, Sodom and, and many of the surrounding areas, they are essentially led into captivity by, the, by, by a king. I'm not going to pronounce his name because I wouldn't be able to do it correectly. He's the king of Elam. E-L-A-M. I'm not going to try to say his name. But it ends up in Genesis chapter 14 that they are under captivity to this king. And what Abram does is he goes and he saves his hide, basically. He goes and he delivers Lot and all of the country of Sodom. He delivers them from this king and rescues them. Abraham coming to the rescue in Lot's life. And this would have been, I believe, a perfect opportunity for Lot to repent of choosing Sodom over Abram. But he doesn't. Abram swoops in and saves the day, and then Lot again chooses to return to the place where he had just gotten in so much trouble. He goes back to that place again. That's in Genesis 14. In Genesis chapter 18, I'm going somewhere with this, we find a, an extremely fascinating passage of Scripture. In Genesis chapter 18, we find Abram interceding for Sodom. Y'all remember that passage, right? God comes to Abram and he says, Shall I hide from Abraham that thing that I do? And Abram was a friend of God and he is going to tell Abram the fact that he's about to go and destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. And we find Abraham's heart is, is, is torn over that. So much so that he begins to pray for Sodom and Gomorrah and you will not convince me that, that, that what is on his heart is not his nephew Lot. God comes to Abram and says, I'm going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. Abram knows Lot lives in Sodom and Gomorrah. And his heart is touched and we find Abram begging God on the behalf of his nephew, Lot. And y'all know the passage. He says, if you will find 50 righteous, will you not destroy the city? That's that passage where he says, shall not the judge of all the earth do right? says, it's not like God to destroy the righteous with the wicked. Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? If you find 50 righteous, will you spare the city? God says, I'll spare it for 50. Abram says, well, what about for 45? God says, I'll spare it for 45. He says, what about 40? I'll spare it for 40. What about 30? What about 20? What about 10? And what I believe is in the heart of Abram is that he is thinking about his, his, his nephew Lot and his family, and he's thinking, surely there's ten. We'll look at it in a little while, but Abram at this point has at least been in Sodom for over 13 years. He's, he's sitting there counting up Lot and his, and his four, at least four daughters and what would be their sons and his wife. And he's, he's, he's doing the math and he's thinking, well, surely there's ten. 
Surely there are ten righteous people because I know my nephew is down there in Sodom. So he says, God, if, you'll, if there are ten there that are righteous, will you not spare or will you not destroy the city? And God says, I will. And what we're going to find is that there are not ten righteous there. God was true to his word, but there were not ten righteous there. When we're reading through these, these chapters, when we read chapter number 19, the verse that we read, this, uh, this past message that we preached out of these verses, where he is trying to defend these angels and offer up his children in the same verse, we find he, he's a whirlwind. Listen, you never know which lot is going to show up. You don't know if you're going to run into Genesis 12 lot or Genesis 13 lot. Or Genesis 14 lot or Genesis 19 lot. Or in Genesis 19, is he going to try to defend the angels and offer his children? When we, when we study the life of Lot, we find what could possibly be the most inconsistent saved person that you could possibly find. And what I believe a lot of us are struggling from is inconsistency. Amen? inconsistency. And when I read the life of Lot, all I find is inconsistency. You find moments of faith. You find moments of great failure. And what we're going to look at tonight is the impact of inconsistency. What does Lot's inconsistency cause around him? What does it cause for his family? What does it cause for the lost souls that surrounded his life? And my prayer is that God will help us with our consistency. Amen. Amen. God will help us to be faithful. We have a faithful God who's the same yesterday, today, and forever. But for many of us, yesterday, we weren't the same as we are today. And we're probably not going to be the same tomorrow. What I'm saying is, we have a faithful God and many of us are not faithful in return. And we struggle with the same symptom of inconsistency of being up and down and in and out. And you never know which, which one of us you're going to meet. And that's not God's will for our life. That's not what God wants. That's not what God desires for us. And when we look at Lot's life, we're going to find the impact of inconsistency. I pray that it will motivate us and help us to be faithful to our Lord. Amen. Let's look in verse number 5. Genesis chapter 19. I know I had a long introduction. It's a shorter message. Look in verse Number 5. Genesis 19 and verse number 5. First of all, I want to say that Lot's inconsistency caused the world's impressions. The world's impressions. Look in verse number 5. It says, And they called unto Lot and said unto him. Now at this point, these two angels have already entered into Lot's home. It says that they called unto Lot, and they said unto him, Where are the men which came in to thee this night? Bring them out unto us, that we may know them. And Lot went out at the door unto them, and shut the door after him. And he said, I pray you, brethren, do not so wickedly. Behold now, I have two daughters which have not known man. Let me, I pray you, bring them out unto you, and do ye to them as it is good in your eyes. Only unto these men do nothing, for therefore came they under the shadow of my roof. And they said again, Stand back. And they said, excuse me, and they said, stand back. And they said again, this one fellow came in to sojourn, and he will needs be a judge. Now we will de deal worse with thee than with them. And they pressed, upon the, pressed sore upon the man, even Lot, and came near to break the door. Obviously, these verses we find how that these men, these angels are in jeopardy. By the way, these angels were never really in jeopardy. We find out if you read the story that they smite all of them with blindness and they're all saved. And so Lot was really, uh, he, he shouldn't have been trying to do what he was doing. But he, he, we, we find these two angels, essentially they're in danger. Then Lot tries to offer his daughters uh, as, as, as uh, something to, to cause them to leave those men alone. And then eventually we find Lot getting in trouble himself. And now they're trying to attack Lot and they're trying to break down the door. But what interests me about these verses is that we find the faults of the world about Lot in these verses, in verse number 9 in particular. We get to find out what the men of Sodom thought about Lot. 
We get to find the world's impression. What they're, what, what they, when they looked at Lot, what did they think? When they saw Lot, what did they see? So read verse number 9 again. And they said, stand back. And they said again, this one fellow came in to sojourn. First of all, I want to say that they thought that he was a fellow. That's what the verse says. They said, this one fellow came in to sojourn. You know what a fellow is? It's an equal. If if, if someone is a fellow, that word fellow, it means one of the same kind. It means one of a pair, a companion, an associate. These people who lived around Lot, when they saw Lot, they said, he's a fellow. That means in their mind, there was nothing different about Lot. I think we've got a lot of that going on in our churches in our day. We've got a lot of people who are saved. Again, Lot is saved. But as far as the world is concerned, when they looked at Lot, they said, yeah, he's a fellow. He's an equal to me. He's a, he's a pair. We're, we're two of a kind, me and Lot. That's what the world thought about when they saw Lot. Let me ask, what does the world think when they see us? Do they see anything different? God help there to be something different about us. God help this world to not think that we're a fellow to them. That, that we're in the same condition, that, that, we're, that we're doing the same things outwardly. When they looked at Lot's life, they said, yeah, this guy, he's a fellow. He's a pair. You know how, to, you know how that you know that two things are a pair? They're identical. They're either identical or they're symmetrical. Either way, you say those two things, they go together. Y'all ever seen those old pictures and stuff in the workbooks? Well, they'll have a scene on one side, and they'll have a scene on the other side, and they'll say, it'll say to spot the differences. Y'all ever seen that? There'll be a picture on one side and a picture on the other side, and what they'll do is they'll make just slight differences to the right side, different from the left, and they'll say, try to, try to pick out what's different about these two pictures. In them calling Lot a fellow, what they're saying is there were no differences. That means Lot talked the same way that they talked. Somebody help me tonight. They, 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 Lot looked the same way that they looked. He conducted himself in the exact same way that they did, so much so that they thought of him as a fellow. I've always heard fellowship defined as two fellows in a ship. That means that they're going to the same place, that they're, that, they're, that they're conducting themselves in the same way, and God help those that are saved by the grace of God not to be fellows with the world. Now, I'm not saying we shouldn't be a friend to them. The Bible says that Jesus was a friend to publicans and sinners, right? This man received his sinners and evil of them. I'm not talking about not being their friend. I'm talking about not being their fellow. Not looking like them and talking like them and acting like them. There should be a difference. Amen? I feel like I read this verse all the time. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse number 14, where it says, To be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers, for what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? There should be something that is so different about you that the world around you knows it. We got young people, we got kids that are going to school. God help us if our young people fit in perfectly with the sinners that are around them. But you know what? A lot of times people who who are saved, they don't want to stand out. Because when you stand out, that means you're different. When you stand out, that means you're weird. Something that people will say, something must be wrong with you if you're not a fellow. So what we have is a whole lot of saved people that are going to heaven, but they're trying to look like the world and act like the world so that the world won't look at them and think they're different. 
We're supposed to be different. We're supposed to stand out. We're not supposed to, to be fellows, to be pairs with the world. They thought they were fellows. Secondly, they thought that he was a false witness. Let's look back in verse number 9 again. This is going to take a minute for me to explain. Verse number 9. They said, this one fellow, then it says this, that he came in to sojourn. That word sojourn, it, it means just to, to be a temporary resident. If you're sojourning, that means you have no intentions to stay. You're just passing through, right? We're, we're sojourners in this world. We're going to heaven. This isn't our eternal home. We're just passing through. Uh, we're, we're strangers. We're pilgrims. That's what a sojourn is. That's what a sojourner is. And, and, and they said, this man Lot is a sojourner. He came, into, he came into sojourn. You say, well, how do they know that? I believe Lot told them. Where else would they have gotten that impression? Lot comes in. I imagine he moves on and he knows that this is a sinful place. He knows that this is a wicked place. He has no business there. And he lets everybody know, yeah, I know this is Sodom. And I know that I'm a saint. I know that I'm saved. But I, I don't, I'm not going to stay here long. I'm just going to hang out for just a little while. And I'm going to be on my way. And word gets around Sodom that, well, that Lot, he's too good for us. He's, he's just planning to move right on in and move right on out. Has no intentions to stay. I don't have time to prove it. But when you go to Genesis chapter 14, in the first few verses, you find out that, that between the time that Lot goes to Sodom and, and the time that the king of Elam comes in and takes captivity of them, he was there for 13 years. And then when you move to Genesis 18, after he's already been delivered and he's still back in Sodom, we find from Genesis 18, based on the age of Abram, from Abram at the birth of Ishmael versus the birth of Isaac, we find now that he's been there another 13 years. So by the time we get to Genesis 19, this sojourner, who's, he's, I'm not really here to stay, I'm not going to live like this long, he's been there for at least 26 years. You know who Lot was to them? He was a liar. Lot said he was going to leave. He said he's just sojourning, but year after year they keep running into Lot. And they keep seeing Lot. And they see him putting his, his tent stakes deep. And he's, he's forming a life there. And he's marrying his daughters there. He's not living like a sojourner. He's not living like he plans to leave. He's living like Sodom is his home. He's marrying his daughters there. He's sitting at the gate. All, all, all uh, the, the signs that you can see in Genesis 19, it doesn't sound like he's planning to leave. We got a whole lot of Christians today that don't live like sojourners. We'll say that we're sojourners. We'll say, I'm just a pilgrim passing through, heading on to a better country. I'm going to heaven. This world's not my home. And yet we live like this world is our home. And the way that we live speaks so loudly, the world doesn't care what we say. What Abraham, what, what Lot was saying didn't match how Lot was living. This one fellow, he came in to sojourn. He's been there for over 26 years. You know what will happen in your life? You'll say, well, I'm going to go to Sodom, but I'm not going to stay there long. I'm going to live like they do. I'm going to act like they do. I'm going to talk like the world does, but I'm not going to do it for long. We got a lot of people who are saved by the grace of God who've been living like sodomites for years. Amen? I'm talking about spirits. I'm talking about, about the way that they conduct themselves. They conduct themselves just like the world around them does, and yet they say that they're just a sojourner. So, so in, in the mind of the world, in the mind of those sodomites, he was a fellow, but he's also he's a false witness. He's lying to them. So his word means nothing. His testimony means nothing. 
If there's anything that you and I need in our day, it is for our testimony to carry weight with the lost people around us. We need that. We need, we need for when we say that Jesus saves, it to carry weight because our life has not contradicted that statement. But so many people live their lives as if God really doesn't save, as if they really don't have the Holy Spirit living inside of them. In their mind, he was inconsistent, and that caused him to be a fellow and a false witness and also a fake. Look at the last part of the verse there, verse number 9. Well, the next part of the verse, it says, This one fellow came into sojourn, watch this, and he will needs be a judge. Look back in verse number 5. We read it a moment ago. Excuse me, verse number 7. Verse number 7. He looks at them and he says, I pray you, brethren, do not so wickedly. Why is he calling them brethren? These are lost people. These are wicked individuals. He's calling them brethren. No wonder they called him a fellow. They're going to associate with him because he is associating with them. He's saying, I'm one of you. Come on, brethren. And then he says, do not so wickedly. I can imagine those sodomites being upset. Wait a minute. You've been living with us for 26 years. You chose to be here. This one came in to sojourn, and now you're going to be a judge? Now that these angels have showed up, now you're going to be holier than thou? Now you're going to tell, oh, now you're going to tell me that we're sinners. Now that you're going to tell me that we're wicked. Where before the angels showed up, you were living just like us, you were dwelling among us, and there was no problem until the angels showed up. You know how he appeared to them? Like a fake, like a hypocrite. Oh, now you're going to be a judge. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 7, verse number 1, it says to judge not that ye be not judged. For with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged. And with what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you again. What Jesus is saying there is that if you're going to judge, you better live up to the same standard. Amen? Amen? He's not saying not to judge at all. The Bible says that he, just, he that is spiritual judgeth all things. What Jesus is saying is, if you're going to hold somebody else to a standard, you better live up to that standard. Amen. And what they're saying is, no lot, I know you're a fellow. I know who you are, and now you're going to tell me that we're living wicked. No, they don't want to hear it from you because you've already lost your testimony with them. What will happen is folks will go to work and they'll hear through the grapevine that somebody's a Christian. Or that person over there, they go, they go to church. They're one of those churchgoers, one of them church-going people. And then they get around you and they start working around you and fellowshipping with you and they realize, yeah, this person don't live like a Christian. And then one day you come to church and you get convicted and you start to repent and you try to live right and then you go back to that person and you try to witness to them and you've already lost the opportunity. Because, because they're going to say, no, I know who you are. Oh, now you're going to be a judge. Now you're better than me. Now you have something that I need. No, you don't have anything I need because you're living the same way that I'm living. Amen. His inconsistency shaped the world's impression of him. And listen, the way that you and I live, it does shape the world's impression of us, but through us, it will shape their impression of Christ. We're ambassadors to this world. We represent Jesus to them. And if you and I have a weak Christian life, they're going to think you and I serve a weak Savior. We don't serve a weak Savior. He's mighty to save. But if you and I live like Lot, if we live an inconsistent Christian life, they're going to take that as an opportunity to say that all that Jesus stuff's not true, all that Bible stuff's not real, I don't need church, I'm just as good as they are. His inconsistency shaped the world's impression of him. Secondly, his inconsistency impacted the warning to be ignored. Look in verse number 20, 
or excuse me, look at verse number 12. Verse number 12. Almost done. Verse 12. He says, And he said, And the men said unto Lot, Hast thou any besides son-in-law and thy sons and thy daughters and whatsoever thou hast in the city? Bring them out of this place. For we will destroy this city, because the cry of them is waxing great before the face of the Lord, and the Lord hath sent us to destroy it. Verse 14. Listen to this. One of the saddest verses in the Bible is verse number 14. It says, And Lot went out and spake unto his sons-in-law, which married his daughters, and said, Get you up out of this place, for the Lord will destroy this city. But he seemed as one that mocked unto his sons-in-law. That word mock there, it means literally to, to ridicule or, or essentially to trick. They thought that Lot's trying to trick us with all this, the sky is falling stuff. He, he's telling us that, that God is going to destroy us. And Lot had so marred his testimony by his inconsistent living that when he preached a warning of judgment, his family didn't even believe him. I've got family that I need to believe me. When I say that there's a hell below and a heaven above and a Jesus that died to save their soul, I need my family to believe me. I need my warning to be heeded, not to be ignored. But his life caused it so that when he had a message, when he had a warning to give, they thought, he's, he's crazy. He's, mock, he's, he's, he's insulting us. He's trying to trick us. What he's saying cannot be true. Another sense of that word mock, it literally means to sport. As if to play. Like it's a joke. Like it's a game. What happened was, Lot lived an inconsistent Christian life. He played a game. Lot was playing a game. And then when he tries to tell his sons-in-law about impending judgment that's going to come, they said, well... He's never been serious before about this stuff. So he's probably just playing that game again. Somebody help me tonight. That, that's what happens. When you take your Christian life as a game, don't be surprised when other people think you're playing a game. It's the boy who cried wolf. Right? It, it's Lot who's been inconsistent and up and down and back and forth, and he says he's a sojourner, but he's staying there. He says that he's believed the promise, but he's a fellow to these sodomites. You just never know what Lot is going to do. And because of that, when he does try to do right, and when he does try to share this, this warning of judgment, they say, well, he's, he's just playing that game again. This thing's not a game, folks. Amen. It's not a game. We preached about it this morning, about the reality of a place called hell, and that's not a game either. His inconsistency caused people not to take him seriously. So his warning was ignored. Lastly, let's look at the wicked's incineration. Look at verse 23. Look at verse 23. We're talking about the impact of Lot's inconsistency. His back and forth Christian life, what did it cause? It caused the lost people around him not to believe his message and to think that he was just a fake, that he was a liar, it caused his family to ignore the warning. And ultimately it resulted in, in those that he could have won. Those who could have been saved were not saved. And they were incinerated. When fire fell from heaven, God devoured the land. Look in verse number 23. It says, When the sun was risen upon the earth, when Lot entered into Zoar... Then the Lord rained upon Sodom and Gomorrah fire, excuse me, brimstone and fire from the Lord out of heaven. And he overthrew those cities and all the plain and all the inhabitants of the cities. You know who that included? His daughters, his sons-in-law, those that, that didn't want to hear his message. You know who else that includes? Those people at the door who were trying to, to, to take him and to hurt him who thought he was a fellow. 
all of those people that he had impressed or had an impression on, and he caused them to think that his spiritual life was just a game, so that when he told them of judgment, they didn't believe it. All of those people were destroyed. They were destroyed. You say, well, why were they destroyed? Because Lot was playing games. Because Lot wasn't being serious about his life, about his, about his relationship with God. What we need is some people who are saved by the grace of God to start living as if they're saved by the grace of God and taking this thing seriously. This isn't just a game. This isn't just something that we do on Sundays and Wednesday nights just to take up some time and to pat ourselves on the back and soothe our consciences because of our sin. That's not what this is. We're talking about heaven and hell. We're talking about eternity in the lake of fire for those who do not believe the message that God has given us to share but they're not going to believe it if we're inconsistent. Listen, I have a God who's very consistent. I have a God who is faithful, who is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Every time that I've called on Him, He's been the exact same for me, but what we need to do is be the same for Him. The way that we wake up and spend our day Sunday should be the same way that we wake up and spend our day Monday. It, it, it should be the exact same. And if it's not, those around us will know. Listen, you can fool the preacher. You can fool the Sunday school teacher. You can fool everybody uh, that just sees you a couple times a week and make them think that you really do love Jesus and you really do live for God and you live a holy and a clean and a sanctified life. But the people in your home know the real you. Husband, you can hide it from me, but you can't hide it from your wife. She knows who you are. Amen? Amen. Parents, we can't hide it from our kids. They know who we are. They know what's important to us. They know if we really love God and live for God. It's time some of us get consistent. Amen? Ask God to help us to be uh, true to Him and to be faithful to Him because He's been so faithful to me. Amen. I want to serve Him. I want to live for Him. I want to love Him. And what I want is for my testimony and my gospel, my gospel witness to be believable because I've not already spoiled it because of how I've lived.